We'll give it just another minute or two before we get started as we let people um, enter the Zoom session. All right, since it is the top of the hour, we will go ahead and get started um, and welcome again, everyone. I know some people are still coming in, um, but welcome to the second Alaska Request for Applications Technical Assistance and FAQ session. This is our last one. So after this session, within the next week, we'll have the slides and recording um, posted to that website that we shared with everyone when we sent out the RFA. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to a couple of reminders before we get started. So we are recording this session. Again, it's going to be posted along with the slides afterwards so you can review if you know any um, colleagues that have missed this session and would find this information beneficial, they'll be able to access this. During the session, if you have any uh, questions, just submit those to the chat and we'll be monitoring. There will also be time at the end um, for an open floor for questions. If you could have your cameras on when possible, that would be great. Try to avoid distractions and be ready to participate. So again, as you come in, just drop in the chat your name, your organization, your job title, your land acknowledgements, and then as Mandy said in the chat, how you like to recreate as a little icebreaker. If you need closed captioning, just go to settings, uh, then accessibility, then turn on closed captioning through there. Um, and then we'll do some introductions. So my name is Teresa Bright. I'm a program associate with the School-Based Health Alliance, and I am on the team, a part of the team that oversees this funding opportunity. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge um, the land that I am on um, is the Susquehannock. I'm coming from Central Pennsylvania, State College, Pennsylvania today. I will turn it over to Mandy and Teresa to introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Mandy LeBlanc. I get to represent School Based Health Alliance today from Seattle, uh, which is also the Duwamish and Suquamish land. And I'll toss it over to Teresa. Awesome. Thank you. Welcome. My name is Teresa Dominguez. I'm Director of Programs. Uh, the land I'm in in Florida is Seminole, Tokabaga, Mississuki, and Moscow lands. And I'll turn it back to you, Teresa. All right. And I will turn it over to our partners at the Alaska Department of Health. We have Wendy on today to introduce herself. Hey, I'm Wendy Williams, uh, and I will um, introduce Lindsay and I. We both work for the Department of Health um, in public health in the Women, Children, and Family Health section, um, supporting student um, health and wellness for our school districts all across Alaska. And uh, we both live, work, and play uh, in the land of the Denina. And um, how I like to recreate, as I saw the icebreaker, uh, I like to get out with my husky puppies uh, and watch them pounce in the snow. All right, thank you, Wendy. Uh, we'll go over next the session agenda. Um, so first up, we're going to learn about SBHA and our role in this RFA, then Alaska Department of Health and their role. Um, that we'll then identify some grant information, and then we'll go over the review of, of submitted questions on the, during the FAQ portion. After that, we'll have an open floor for questions and share some resources about school-based health care. So before we review the RFA, um, we would like to introduce, if you're not familiar, we'd like to give a little introduction into the School-Based Health Alliance. 
So SBHA is a DC-based nonprofit that serves as a national voice for school-based healthcare. All children and adolescents deserve to thrive, but too many struggle because they lack equitable access to healthcare services. School-based healthcare is one solution in bringing healthcare to where students typically spend the majority of their time in school. Um, so since 1995, SBHA has supported and advocated for high quality healthcare in schools, and we support the improvement of students' health via school-based healthcare by supporting and creating community and school partnerships. Um, we do this uh, through policy standards, data, and training. And then, so when health and education come together, that's where we see great things happen. You see attendance improving, chronic conditions are better managed, acute issues are getting quick and expert attention, and we all know that healthy students make better learners. And Mandy, I realized we didn't do the poll, so I think now would be a great time to pull that up, and we'd like to see who we have on the call today. Great, I just posted the poll. All right, so we'll leave that up for 30 seconds to a minute, get everyone a chance to put their answers in, and then we'll share the results. Seems like we have a variety already of school personnel, SBHC operational staff, and other. So if your other type in the chat what the other is, we would love to know. And we'll leave it up for just a few more seconds. All right, so I will end the poll and we can share the results. All right, so a couple of school personnel, a couple of SBHC operational staff and other, which is great. It's great to get a variety of people on these calls. Um, and, and I think a lot of people, a lot of different roles can benefit from the information that we're sharing today. We'll stop sharing. And I will pass it off to Wendy to talk about Alaska Department of Health and their role in the RFA. Oh, Mandy, I think you're muted. Or Wendy, sorry. I apologize. <laughs> uh, so we at the Alaska Department of Health section of Women, Children, and Family Health have had the opportunity um, to contract with the, the National School-Based Health Alliance to be able to oversee the disbursement and administration of funds to support school-based health centers here in Alaska. Uh, Alaska is a local control state um, for school districts. Uh, so there is no uh, legislation that demands school-based health centers or school-based health centers in Alaska in any form. Um, and local control just means that those school districts have the opportunity to make the decision how their funds are going to be spent to be able to support their students based on their community specific needs. Um, and so that may mean, uh, oh, could we go to the next slide real quick? So what that can look like here in Alaska um, for school nursing or health services is that those services can vary widely. Um, so some school districts may opt to not staff a school nurse. Um, some may decide to um, have a part-time or um, support in some sort of volunteer capacity. Um, and some may decide to have a full-time nurse in every school. So here in Alaska, uh, this map just represents our 54 different school districts. Um, and of those, um, in the, within those school districts, there's about 500 schools um, supporting the education um, of 130,000 students or just over. Of those 54 school districts, uh, currently 16 um, have opted to employ a school nurse for school health supports during this educational day. Uh, they support approximately 300 schools and about 100,000 of those 130,000 students. Uh, of the 16, uh, six have more than one school nurse which mean 10 have one school nurse for their entire district, whether that school nurse is part-time uh, or full-time, uh, supporting multiple schools for all the students in those districts, in that district. Uh, which means we have approximately 125,000 students who have no nursing um, support or services statewide. Uh, and as we know, um, Alaska is a very large state covering a lot of distance. Um, and so the rural districts 
um, the support that they have in their community may be limited um, and require travel across wide distances for those families or students to be able to get services. Uh, within Alaska's school districts, we also currently have about six school-based health centers. Uh, currently, those are supporting um, students and family health and wellness um, in the areas of Anchorage, Juneau, Bethel, um, Petersburg, uh, and Sitka for Mount Edgecombe. And um, we have one uh, school district, Lower Yukon, who um, is staffing an, um, uh, a nurse in our school and partnering um, with um, a hospital and clinic here in Anchorage to provide support for their um, boarding school um, um, here in Anchorage for those families that opt to, to bring their, their students in for that um, educational opportunity. Um, school nurses and school-based health centers work together. We have a shared critical mission and we wanna protect um, and advance the health and well-being of our school-aged children. Uh, one health option does not replace the need for the other. They're very unique uh, and each um, uh, operate in a very distinct and complementary function to meet student and school uh, community health needs. School-based health centers can fill the gap for the medical need that students and families uh, have. Uh, while connecting those students and their families to a healthcare provider or a long-term medical home. And that's our goal is we want students to have a medical home, uh, but we know Alaska has many challenges and um, those opportunities aren't always available. So we wanna be able to bring, student, um, bring those services um, to our families and students where they are in the schools to help support their health needs. So the role um, of what a school nurse or health services from a school nurse standpoint, um, what does that look like? Well, the CDC identifies that physicians, nurses, dentists, health educators, and other allied health prof professionals are qualified to provide these services. However, the school nurse is the most likely school health staff to be responsible for day-to-day -day health of students, provide routine assessments of health, needs and coordinate health services within a school. But in the absence of a school nurse, these duties fall onto the school staff. Uh, so our teachers, our office staff, the school principal um, are tasked with providing those additional medical supports without um, the, the, the education or the knowledge that our um, our physicians, our nurses, our dentists, or health educators would have to support those services, which means parents, um, it relies on, on the, it falls on the parent to delegate that care, provide the training, um, and troubleshoot and support. So the role of the school nurse, um, the CDC and other um, national organizations indicate that schools should provide school health services uh, to improve the health and well-being of our students, identify and prevent health problems ensure the care for students, and minimize those health barriers that impact their learning and their educational opportunities. The National Association of School Nurses um, identifies or um, defines school nursing as a specialized practice of professional nursing, which advances the well-being, academic success, and lifelong achievement and health of students. Uh, and here in, on this slide, we've pictured um, some of our Alaska nurses providing care to our Alaska students. And I'll go ahead and pass it on back to Mandy. Well, Wendy set us up perfectly to talk a little bit more about the word information. And if you were on our last segment, we uh, added a couple more slides. We wanted to be very clear about the difference between school-based health centers, school-based health center uh, services, and the role of a school nurse, which Wendy has already did a really good job of laying that out. So just wanted to make sure uh, that you're aware April 30th is a due date. There are no exceptions. After this uh, time period, um, we will answer other questions. So feel free to email us, call us, and if you need to set up a phone call, we will do that. So as I said, uh, the goal of this is to support students' health 
well-being and academic success by providing school-based health care. Uh, and that often is wrapped into mental health services, primary care, oral health, and vision services. So school-based health centers are the most comprehensive type of school-based health care, but we recognize uh, with the unique landscape of Alaska that uh, it can we can look at school-based health care, and we'll talk a little bit more about that and what that looks like. So centers tend to be located in or adjacent to a school where students can receive integrated medical, mental health, and other healthcare services, such as dental care, whereas school-based health care still takes place on school grounds, but may not be as integrated. So an example of that would be where community health care partners connect with the student while they're at the school, using telehealth to address a health care need, rather than having an actual school-based health center at the school. So school-based health centers represent the most extensive form of school-based health care. And at the same time, due to the unique nature of Alaska's geography, school-based health centers might not be always be a feasible option. So I just want to put that out there. We are aware of that. So we're looking for unique applications that can include outreach, equipment, telehealth, mobile units, health promotion, and health education. So the next slide, uh, this is just a review really of what Wendy went over. School health services include school nurses, school psychology, school counselors, and school social, um, school social workers services. Um, and it's not limited to, to that, but under school health services, they're under FERPA, which is Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. So what is an SBHC? So again, just making sure that we're pulling out the differences. School-based health centers are a type of school-based health care, shared commitment between school, community, and healthcare organization. So again, it's a shared commitment. It's a it's teamwork. It's not one individual organization, but it's working together, most importantly with the school and other organizations. School-based health centers offer the most comprehensive type of school-based health care to support student health, well-being, and academic success. And it works with existing school services and care providers, but does not replace, and I'll say it again, work with existing school services and care providers, but we do not replace. The goal is not to replace, but work with. So the unique model of school-based health centers is really that it's a space is typically provided by school at a no cost uh, for the external healthcare entity. Providers are able to navigate the school health system, including HIPAA and FERPA, and then looking at um, the desired skills and time for relationship building. So you're, you're forming bonds with teachers, principals, parents, and it's a little bit more unique um, and it does call for a different type of staffing as well, knowing staffing time uh, or time that or would be clinic hours could be maybe caught up in a, a fire drill outside, or it could be caught up in uh, doing a assembly for the freshman students, for example. So looking at that, the re unique role uh, the providers in this type of setting has, um, but also the impact that it's able to make. So if we look at the funding period as we go from the type of services that can be offered, the funding period, again, we already know the deadline, the contract term, we're really nice, um, been able to be even awarded with time. Time has been great uh, starting at um, the end of the school year and then being the duration of most of one school year. So June, 2024 to May 30th, 2025. A notice of grants will be May 15th. And then the first grantee meeting will be June 5th. And then it is a one-time funding. Uh, it's non-renewable and non-refundable at this time. So for each project, uh, the it's up to 250,000 per application. And note that we may uh, make multiple awards and it could be less than the amount. So if you know your site only needs 90,000, then go ahead and apply for that 90,000. And that is quite all right. And then, um, you know, we're looking again for a mix of models. So whether it's telehealth, mobile, we want to see that. <clears throat> so then if we look at um, the application types, 
there are definitely two exciting applications that we're looking for. So one is for the state level school-based healthcare infrastructure. We've talked a lot about the new or expanded school-based healthcare. Um, that's another application. But for the state level, what we're looking for is a group committed to working on a state level school-based healthcare infrastructure with the aim to equip the group to independently offer technical assistance. That is very exciting. Um, Alaska is a unique place and it's great to have someone on the grounds of Alaska working to advance the work that you all are doing. So we're excited to see applications for that. And just like I said in the last one, last meeting, uh, collaborations and working together with multiple agencies, that could be done as well through the state level school-based healthcare infrastructure. Um, what we're looking for is a good fit for the state of Alaska and that um, you know the, the peers are also interested um, in this organization or person moving forward. So as we get into who is eligible, so we're looking for applications that address the target populations. And that is the students who attend schools where the new or expanded school-based healthcare can be located. And again, that could be an extension of families uh, outside of the students, but the main focus are the students. So if you have an application and it includes services for the community, that is okay. And then if we look at the school-based healthcare model, located on the grounds of the school, school district, school board, or Indian tribe or tribal organization, organized through school, community, and health provider relationships, administered by a sponsoring facility, and um, provide primary health care in accordance with laws. So nothing new that we've talked about there. And then last but not least, um, with the submitting of applications, all applications must be submitted through Qualtrics, that's the survey tool that we're using. If you're having issues, I know some have wrote, arose already, please let us know, send us an email. We'll make sure we have our, our email is gonna be at the end of our presentation, but email is there and everyone who's working on this project will be able to see that. Uh, do not complete the application on a mobile device. It is best used on a computer, laptop, any of those, but a mobile device is not the best place to fill out this application. All applicants must fill the authorization form linked after submitting the main application and ensure the previous questions have been filled out uh, before you're able to move on to the next page of the application. Your application actually does save, so you're able to go back to it, um, but you must go to the application if you're going a second time using the same device uh, that you previously used. So if you go from using the laptop in your home to the laptop at your work, and they're two different devices, you will have two different applications going on. It will not be the same. Um, so just try to start it and end it on the same uh, device. And then if you have issues with that, uh, we have folks that can help us with, with those questions. So please let us know. Uh, but they do tell us, clear your cache if you're having issues. If you're having bigger issues, please email us and we'll try to get you all connected with the right person. Um, we are here to assist you. And I'm gonna pass it to Mandy. Thank you, Teresa. I get to present on the frequently asked questions that we've received so far. The application, is there a work plan template for the request? No template is required, but we are looking for a work plan that you can attach that is under two pages, please. Can organizations submit an application for multiple sites? Yes. You can apply for different funding for multiple sites. Just please uh, be mindful that you include those sites. Would it be acceptable to submit one application for funding to support part-time rotating mobile medical school-based health services at four schools in a single district, or would we need to submit a separate proposal for each individual school? One application should be submitted for these sites that you're applying for. We are considering applying for funds for a mobile medical van. If we are awarded for funding for a van, it can take months to order a van and then get delivery. Would that be permitted? Yes, that can be permitted. Just be mindful that of that time that it will take from the time you order it to the ability to have outreach, marketing, training, and other related services before you get to see the students. 
Does this project allow schools the option of an a la carte service? For example, could the services be limited to just one or two services, such as mental and behavioral health or health promotion or education, or does it have to be all encompassing? Applicants can apply to establish or expand one or multiple services. Now the question has come for budget. Is indirect allowed? Yes, indirect is allowed as part of program costs, and it is capped at 10% to be in line with organizational policy and directly related to site costs. How much minor technical assistance is allowed? Technical assistance is allowed through the funding period. The funding request must be accompanied by a budget justification. Can the budget include travel, staff training, and development? Yes, and these must be relevant to the submitted work plan. Moving on to our miscellaneous questions. Can you explain the expenses for the school? So when there's a partnership between a school and a healthcare organization or something similar, the cost of the school would depend on your partnership agreement. Types of expenses can range from the cost of water, electricity, cleaning services, et cetera, but may vary depending on each arrangement. Can we apply for both services and technical assistance money? Yes, via two separate applications. So there's the school-based health application and then the state application. Make sure that you do both of those and not put them all in one application to ensure success. Who from the program staff, which role is required to attend the monthly group calls and training meetings? No specific role is required, but we are looking for somebody to consistently attend the meetings so that we have a fluid uh, focus on making sure that the grant requirements are met. Can this funding be used for advocacy and or lobbying at the state or federal level? Funding can be used for advocacy to support and sharing the work you do, but lobbying is not allowed. Is funding contingent on billing for services? The simple answer to that is no. What is the anticipated number of awards and the amount earmarked for the technical assistance award? The number of awards will be varied and is up to $250,000 per award. So as Teresa mentioned, if you don't need the whole $250,000, don't feel like you have to find a way to fit that into your budget. Simply look at what you think that your organization needs and apply for that amount. How does this differ from the HRSA SBHC grant if funded would this disqualify us from future HRSA funding? The grant is managed and overseen by School-Based Health Alliance through a contract with the Alaska Department of Health. So please refer to the HRSA notice of funding in regard to future funding eligibility. What does reporting look like? Additional information is in the RFA. At a minimum, reports will be required regularly to track your progress throughout the grant period. How scalable are these funds? Can schools or districts without a school nurse increase their capacity for telehealth or vision, hearing, dental, et cetera, screenings on site? Yes, the goal is to provide new or expanded school-based health center care, medical and or mental health services to students enrolled in the identified school. How does this funding support collaboration between community-based organizations and districts? This funding supports partnerships between school and community stakeholders to create fully engaged and or accountable partners who provide the spark of leadership that catalyzes the resources, patrons, and institutions. So the goal is that we have more of a partnership. How will School-Based Health Alliance also support the Technical Assistance Award? We will provide support to the state-level organizations as they work to build state affiliation and provide other technical support upon request via email or virtual calls. Will this lead to Alaska standards for school-based health? The School-Based Health Alliance is working with the Alaska Department of Health throughout the grant period and will work with applicants grantees to guide them through throughout the grant period. It is unrelated to Alaska standards. In regards to sustainability, do you have recommendations or suggestions for additional funding to su supplement the project once the grant period ends? So this is currently a one-time grant and sustainability is in incredibly important to, in to be able to continue on with this funding. So sustainable school-based healthcare creates strong partnerships with stakeholders 
including sponsorship organizations, local healthcare providers, students and families, and school partners. They have a diverse funding portfolio, including in-kind donations, patient revenue, and grants. And I wanna add a little bit more about that, that sustainability is critical for school-based healthcare, school-based healthcare centers. What we know is that successful school-based healthcare has a diverse funding portfolio, most often including in-kind partner donations, such as its base, patient revenue through coding and billing, and supplemental grants. To find long-term success, leaders must make a compelling case that provides the model is uniquely suited to help the broader health and education systems to achieve their objectives. So hopefully this is the launch of, of more school-based healthcare. All right. And now it's time to open up the chat and toss it back over to Teresa to cover a few more things where you start to think about your questions that you have. We can see if we can have the answers for you. While you start putting your questions in the chat, I'll pass it back to Teresa. We will go over the resources and I'll pass it to you, Teresa B. <laughs> All right, so we just have a couple of resources here that we want to share with you all that you might find beneficial as you are thinking about applying or are applying to this RFA. Um, so first up, this is our SVHC planning checklist, and it walks through all the key high-level steps to consider during the planning phase. This is for school-based health centers, but useful for school-based health care as well, and that QR code takes you right to it. It's also linked on our website, um, which is what the QR code will take you to, and you'll see the link there at the bottom um, here we have the telehealth, the school-based telehealth program play playbook, which we talked a little bit about telehealth um, previously and how this could be a model that might work best for you when thinking about applying. Um, so SBHA collaborated with the Mid-Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center uh, for telehealth to develop a school-based health school-based telehealth program playbook to guide health centers through the design, implementation, and operation of a telehealth program that meets the needs of children and adolescents. So it includes essential components for school-based telehealth startup, key considerations from health centers across the country, and amenable resources for every stage of planning. So that is linked there. There's a QR code, and then the link is there as well. And again, this takes you to SBHA's website where this is located. We also recently worked on a school-based mobile healthcare toolkit. So again, that's linked here with the link there at the bottom. And this was developed by SBHA to enhance the capacity of healthcare organizations to integrate high-quality, sustainable mobile healthcare services with school-based healthcare programs. Um, and again, we, we touched on mobile healthcare a little bit earlier too. So this is something to definitely check out if you think that this model might work best for your school site. And then we just have here um, a link to our resource hub on SBHA's website. That's what that QR code takes you to. And then there's a lot of tools there, like the mapping tool, hallways to health, blueprint resources, um, other toolkits, a lot, a lot of resources. So definitely encourage you to check that out. And, and there's a search function so you can type in a keyword if you're looking for something specific. If you have any questions or if you're trying to find something and you can't find something, feel free to email us and we can get that to you. Um, and then last, we just wanted to link you to some Alaska Department of Health resources or Alaska specific resources. And the first one up is the school health program from the Alaska Department of Health website, which provides just an overview of the school health program in Alaska focused on the whole school, whole community, whole child model. And then on that website too, you can find additional links to state government partners, community partners, and resources. Also on this slide is the uh, resources to support school health services from the Alaska Department of Health section of Women's Children's and Family Health. And that will have a document that links you to resources to support these services. So it includes uh, information like financial support, Medicaid services. If you're looking to partner with a, um, a healthcare provider, there's information there about doing that and best practices. We also have here the Alaska Youth Risk Behavior Survey, um, and this is a school-based survey of Alaska high school students that collects important information about the health of Alaska teens, and you can view um, the results on this website and then also learn how you can have your school participate if you're interested in that. Um, 
Next is the Alaska Department of Education and Early Childhood Data Center, and this is just a data center, a great resource for school districts, parents, students, and researchers who are looking to better understand Alaska schools and education system. And then last but not least is the Alaska Department of Health Data and Statistics, which just provides an overview, overall health data and statistics in Alaska with links to reports and records. Um, so definitely check that out if you're interested, and I think these all of these resources can help you as you're applying. Um, and again, if you have any questions, just reach out to us about those. And then the last resource or item that we wanna share with you is that School, uh, school Based Health Alliance, the National School Based Healthcare Conference is taking place this summer from June 30th to July 2nd in Washington, DC at the Western Washington, DC Downtown Hotel. And registration is now open. That QR code there takes you to the website with uh, a link to register and more information about the conference. So if you're interested in attending, definitely check that out. Um, and we encourage you, of course, all to attend if you're interested in that. And then as we said too, we're always here to answer questions. I know this is our last FAQ session and we'll post these slides with these questions, but if you have any questions that come up throughout this application period, feel free to email us and we will get back to you with an answer. Our email is there just ways to stay connected, our links to our social media um, page and digest if you'd like to sign up for that. So I will go back to the open floor for questions slide. And feel free to unmute or put your question in the chat if you have any questions. We had one question here from Heather. It says in large districts, there are multiple partners. Is it possible for multiple organizations to submit applications with the same district knowing the funding is limited? Yes, it's okay. Um, what we've seen before is sometimes based on who does what, uh, organizations coming together. The main thing is if more than one um, organization is gonna apply for one school, that's when we run into issues. So. I would say to coordinate and make sure you're connecting with the schools uh, to make sure um, it's clear on how they would like this to roll out and what the next steps are. But multiple applications are okay. Thank you, Teresa. And I see that Lucy's iPhone asks, this, these are good sites, thank you so much. Will this information be shared by email, please? The information will be shared actually via, we'll be posting this recording and the slides on the website, which I put in the chat. But you can also email thank them. Thank you, Mandy. Sure. Yeah, so we'll post it there on the website. And then I imagine we'll send out an email to our contact list to announce that this has been posted with a link to the website. So you'll be able to, you'll have an announcement of when it will be posted. What other questions do you have? I have a question that's really specific to what we're doing most likely, but I'm gonna ask it um, in, in front of everyone. Um, so we've been doing pop-up clinics where we, like kind of mobile-ish where we go into certain schools. And if, if this is only for new and existing programs, if we've already been to a school, if we're gonna go there more and serve more students, would that count as expanding? Yes. Based on the information you're telling us now, that sounds like it would be an expansion because you're increasing your reach uh, to those other sites. Mm -hmm. Well, they're sites that we have been before. They're just not our consistent sites, but we would like to be there more consistently. Yeah, I think when you, when applications are done, being clear if it's expansion, how it's expanding, so we don't have questions about that part. And then if it's new, you know, clarifying why it's new. Um, but I think it would just be needing to clearly say, you know, we were only able to see them once a month or every three months, six months. And with this funds, we'll be able to increase it to monthly. And this will increase our impact or reach to X, Y, Z, something like that. That's perfectly okay. So we're all done with our questions. 
Um, and what we're going to do is we'll stay on a little bit later. I know there were some other questions. We'll stop recording now. And then if you have a specific question and you just want to stay on a little bit, we will